Cool. And I'll hide this guy. Sorry. Yeah, it's a short. What happens if you don't charge it? You charge it? Yeah, does it die? Yeah. Oh, really? It started at zero battery because they left it on in the back. And that all closet thing. He's like, let's wait for the read and then uh, they're going to decide later. Are you taking probiotics? Yeah. No. Yeah. I don't have diarrhea. You might have like a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Like, uh, I don't have any diarrhea. Yeah, it's like that SIBO or whatever. Yeah, I'm taking a PBI. I'm getting a PBI. I'm it's like, oh, you got to be a face pastor. And they said that, uh, 
like, like well, it's even also, I guess you, you got to be a guy anyway, so it's going to be a shape anyway. So I guess it's also not like hot the kidneys or spleen or the kids or the pancreas and the liver. Yeah. And then like, more the gallbladder. It's like if everything is normal, it's like you're still feeling bad. You may want to scope. Yeah. I'm so saying like, I don't want you to scope. I, I was like, just oh, schedule the colonoscopy and the at the same time. Yeah. yeah. But he's like, no, nah, it's like, like, it's, like it's not psychogenic though. I was like, okay, thanks. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's funny, I had a similar thing going on when I was on Temple Beds myself. So. But how long did you have it? Just like three weeks. Yeah, I, had it. I think it was, I was taking like supplements, and I think it was associated with supplements. Yeah, and once I stopped, if you got it, 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 what are you able to eat? I mean, I can eat whatever. It's just I'm not so excited. It's not so excited. But I don't want that. I don't want to eventually have that. Like, you're restricted and die about having it. Yeah, I'm like, it's terrible. I'd rather just be nauseous. Um.
started here on his alternative treatments of Parkinson's disease. Do you have any disclosures? All right. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to talk about the uh, complementary or alternative treatments of Parkinson's disease because I think most of us already know about um, standard, you know, levodopa, carpodopa, deep brain stimulator treatments. So I want to take a look at uh, – different options that we have outside of the conventional um, treatments. So th to define alternative or complementary treatment, it means any treatment that's um, been out in literature in Asia, Europe, that really is not mainstream here in America, basically. So, all right, so the goal of my lecture is, uh, you know, I want to review a little bit about Parkinson's disease, which I'm, I'm sure everybody knows all the details and minutes of it. Uh, and then I'll talk about what um, PMR doctors kind of do in a team function. And then I want to talk a little bit about um, how the physical therapist, occupational therapist, and what kind of what they do during their therapies of Parkinson's disease, because I don't think I really knew what, what they did exactly. And then I'll go into the uh, different alternative treatments, um, what their proposed mechaniz mechanisms are, and then uh, what kind of clinical evidence and uh, data is available behind these. So, so I'll start with the consult of one patient I saw uh, when I admitted this patient um, and see why I want to do this topic and and then uh, and then we'll go through the different alternative treatments you see there uh, from Tai Chi to yoga to acupuncture and vibration therapy and then talk a little bit about them herbals and stuff like that so all right so this is the console that I saw I didn't go in the full console because I just wanted to highlight the assessment and plan so basically it's a female who came in with a long history of um, Parkinson's disease uh, with depression, diabetes, CAD, and the plan, this particular resident wrote, and, and I didn't copy the consult, so we didn't have to see which resident wrote this, but uh, it just said, patient will benefit from a cure we have once medically stable to improve these things, and then, you know, it says continue medical management. I mean, this is a great consult, right? It tells exactly how we should treat this patient to the primary team. So, so when I read this, I was like, you know, this is something that I would, probably write to, actually, because I don't know what to write for people with Parkinson's disease. So I said, you know, why don't I just write something about this so we can maybe offer something on top of uh, what they're already doing with Parkinson's, so. Um, 
So a little bit about Parkinson's. Um, so back in the uh, 1800s, 1850s maybe, um, James Parkinson was the one first described uh, Parkinson's disease, calling it the shaking palsy. Um, it, the incidence of this uh, disease is about 4.5 to 21 cases per 100,000 people uh, in the world, and with a prevalence of about 120 cases per 100,000. That's actually been increasing every year because of the, uh, the health care and how people are living longer from it. Uh, the average age of onset is about 60 years old, and it's a little bit more common in men than women. Not really sure why. Um, and uh, it's a progressive neurological disease that uh, is often can be slowed by medical treatments, but it cannot be stopped. There's no uh, neuroprotective agents at this time. Um, so, you know, there is a wide variation in the incidence of disease being reported uh, for multiple reasons, um, most of which is the uh, diagnosis of disease. Uh, people have sometimes trouble diagnosing Parkinson's initially when they come in with the initial symptoms. Um, also, uh, with uh, how people are reporting this throughout the world and whether people are even going to see doctors when they start, you know, with the symptoms. So, so the etiology of Parkinson's, uh, really unclear. Um, there's proposed that there's a combination of genetic and environmental factors. Uh, environmental factors being like uh, pesticides, um, drinking well water, living in rural areas, stuff like that. In particular, um, there was one Cochrane review that showed um, if you've been exposed to pesticides, you have like an 80% higher chance of having um, Parkinson's down the road, or it's more of a correlation, it's not really proven, so. Um, and then, interestingly, they also noted in that same review in Cochrane that said caffeine intake as well as smoking uh, seemed to correlate with less Parkinson's disease risk. So, a little bit about the anatomy. Um, so, Parkinson's disease, it's really a disease of the um, basal ganglia, the substantia nigra, and the dopamine um, pathways. And as we already know, there's two pathways uh, in this, path, in this um, diagram you can see here. There's a direct and uh, indirect uh, pathway. Um, one is a direct um, excitatory pathway for the motor um, cortex. The other one is a inhibitory. And then the dopamine is being released um, that uh, basically promote these pathways. So I assume we all know this already. So, so in Parkinson's disease, you basically have um, an increased inhibition of the thalamocortical uh, pathway because of the decrease in the release of dopamine. So that's the second picture B there in Parkinson's disease compared to the first one, which is a normal. So you can see. Um, as a result, um, you have uh, inhibition of, uh, like I said, of the, uh, the slamming pa cortical pathway that inhibits movement, but you also have a decreased uh, signal to the um, indirect inhibitory pathway, so then you have more inhibition as well, so it's um, double negative, I guess. Double negative? Yeah. All right. So this is basically, you know, in words um, that you can look at. Nothing crazy, something we learned in MS2. So the uh, pathophysiology of um, Parkinson's disease, there's no um, specific things exactly that defines Parkinson's disease. Um, there's two things that they've kind of defined. One is the loss of pigmented uh, dopaminergic neurons and then the presence of Lewy bodies. Although um, there's no specificity or sensitivity associated with these. And you can see in the slide there that, um, you know, if you look under the staining, that's kind of what you see there. Uh, all right, so now to the clinical stuff. Um, so Parkinson's. So there's no um, exact science. Um, it's, Parkinson's is more of a clinical diagnosis. Uh, you have positive and negative phenomena of Parkinson's disease. Uh, positive phenomena including um, uh, resting tremor, rigidity, and flex posture. Then you have the negative uh, phenomena including bradykinesia, the posture instability, um, you know, the gait uh, freezing phenomena. And then uh, more recently, people have been recognizing more of the non-motor symptoms, um, including dementia, hallucinations, rapid eye movement during the sleep. Um, and then uh, obviously all these things also uh, fluctuate, uh, influenced by your emotions and mood. Um, now, uh, one thing to know just for uh, SAE purposes is that uh, Parkinson's is a uh, uh, power rolling wrist tremor, but um, 
The other tremor, which is often confused, is the essential tremor, which is a uh, 8 to 12 hertz postural kinetic tremor. So if they ever asked you on that on the test. Um, all right, so workup of Parkinson's disease. Um, it's like I said, clinical diagnosis. Um, often you, people get an MRI or CT, which is pretty much unremarkable. Um, some people will start actually with a uh, smelling test. Um, they've said that some people with Parkinson's disease will have a decreased um, smelling ability um, prior to their motor function. Um, uh, although that's not specific for Parkinson's, it's also present in uh, Alzheimer's disease. And then some of the other things is you, uh, you can also you have to rule out Wilson's disease, particularly for patients who you suspect um, Parkinson's disease in uh, age under 40. And then uh, multiple system atrophy, which they can do a uh, the sphincter electromyography, which I've actually never seen. And then um, the most uh, noting um, thing you can do is to give them a uh, like a levodopa or a dopamine agonist that if they see a dramatic or sustained um, response from it, that's more of an indication they have Parkinson's versus not. Um, so the most important thing, though, as clinicians, is probably just uh, okay, care for attention. Make sure you exclude all the secondary causes. You know, like I say, always start with an H and P. Uh, medications, toxins, trauma. Um, medications like uh, neuroleptics can actually block your uh, um, uh, dopamine receptors. So um, just make sure they're not taking that, and you're not just starting them on levodopa and be like, oh. And then toxins, um, high dose like manganese or MPTP. And actually, that's what they use in uh, a lot of the mouse models is they give them the toxin to knock out the, the dopamine receptors to help them uh, study the Parkinson's disease. So, all right. So, um, so the idea of medical management uh, is to control to only control the signs and symptoms. Like I said, uh, there's no actual treatment for Parkinson's. Um, really, the, the goal of treatment is to give them as little as you can while minimizing the uh, side effects of the medications. Uh, all the medications, um, in particular levodopa and carpidopa, are really good for about five years on average. And uh, after that, you start to see a more progressive form of the disease, and also they get more of the uh, side effects of levodopa, which is uh, dyskinesia. Um, in addition, uh, these patients over time, as they get uh, more into this disease and get, become more advanced, they also develop more instability and some uh, dementia, so they all add up to the uh, complexity of our patients. So just a quick review um, of some uh, conventional treatments. You know, there's levodopa, plus or minus carpidopa, and then plus or minus uh, intercapum, which is a, uh, uh, in, actually, it's a uh, COMT inhibitor. It actually, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but it actually increases the level of levodopa in your body as well, along with carpidopa. Um, but the issue with these medications is the more levodopa or the carbidopa or this one you're on, uh, the more likely that you're going to get dyskinesia. And as a matter of fact, I think in the one paper, it said that if you're on all three of these um, down the road, you're like 40% more likely to get dyskinesia like two years faster than everyone else, which is not great. Uh, some of the other ones include amenadine, which is an antiviral medication. They're not sure exactly how it works. They think um, it actually uh, promotes the release of dopamine. Uh, in your receptor, in your uh, brain. Um, so it may actually be neuroprotective, but they're not 100% sure. And then anticholinergic agents, um, which is great for tremors, so great for initial uh, treatment, but not, uh, uh, but you know, a lot of side effects of anticholinergics. Um, and then dopamine agonist, agonists, which actually is the best of all of these um, for Parkinson's. Unfortunately, it doesn't work as well as levodopa. And so usually what they, Use is they, they start with dopamine agonists for patients who are younger who has seen a longer lifespan because it has a less side effects uh, than the levodopa. And then once that fails, then they move to levodopa and they add the carbidopa and they add other stuff as they need to. Um, so that's all very great and you know not too super exciting. So I thought I'd throw in some terms because when we, I talked to SAEs, I definitely missed that question on that when they talked about the different uh, movements and stuff. Um, so, uh, chorea, uh, brief, rapid, forceful, you know, uh, purposeless movement, flinging of the limbs. Um, dystonia, sustained muscle contraction, that, that's kind of like a repetitive twisting motion, um, abnormal posture. 
And then dyskinesia, excessive movement of the muscles um, that really can't be controlled voluntarily um, are kind of the big ones that can be seen as a side effect of the medications. Um, the other ones is good to know for the test. So. All right. Okay, so more importantly, uh, like I said, more recently recognized as uh, non-motor uh, symptoms of Parkinson's disease, and some of the things that they have to deal with is erectile dysfunction, uh, constipation because of the GI hypermobility, um, it's daytime sleepiness, and then uh, fatigue. So, you know, treatment of these non-motor symptoms is equally as important as the motor symptoms. As we all know, um, we should not treat the disease itself, we should treat the patient for who they are, right? All right, so some of the other treatments of Parkinson's, um, uh, surgical options that are outside of uh, medication are deep st brain stimulators, uh, neuroablative lesion surgeries, which are not really done anymore. Uh, it's been replaced by deep brain stimulators. Uh, levodopa, carpodopa, intestinal gel infusion, which has really only been done in Europe. There's actually, I think, a trial going on in the U.S. now. And then fetal cell transplanta uh, transplantation, which is actually uh, very interesting. There's some really great article coming out of uh, Japan, I think. But anyways, they're doing these, but um, it actually, they see some transient effects that where people no longer have the motor, some of the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, but for some reason, uh, it's not sticking. They think it's an issue with your body attacking these transplant these cells and not uh, actually accepting them. So I guess you have to get this like Q monthly, and it's like, you know, really expensive. Okay, so now to the fun stuff that I actually want to talk about. Um, so multidisciplinary approach. So you know, when a patient comes to our clinic, it's important that um, you know we take care of the patient for the holistic and, comp and for everything, not just for you know treating their motor symptoms. We really want to look at them as a person, not as a disease, as I already said. So to really understand, um, I'm not talking really fast. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because that was the, that was the great you know MS2 stuff. So now we get to the stuff that I may, you may or may not know already. All right, so for physiatrists, you know, we want to treat the patients on their function and uh, make sure they're doing well as a whole. So to really understand how to treat them for the function, um, you have to kind of understand why they're having some of these gait and motor just issues when it comes to Parkinson's disease. So as you can see in this graph, so, so some of the big issues of Parkinson's disease is they have shuffling gait pattern, um, decreased cadence and velocity, and some of that is because from the Parkinson's disease, you have bradykinesia and hypokinesia and you have difficulty with movement and uh, initiation. As a result, you get the gait disturbance there. And then you also have impaired uh, motor task performance, so you have festinations. And then for the freezing gait, you know, it's also because of the uh, hypokinesia and then the poor movement initiation, and as well as poor execution. Um, you also get the uh, poor balance and unsteadiness, and of course you have the fear of falling, and then you, know, you have medication effects such as dyskinesia and dystonia. So as physiatrists, um, our goal is to uh, design and really update some of the exercise uh, for these patients. Uh, we want to make sure that we take care of their general health as that defines their uh, functional health. And then, of course, treat the uh, non-motor symptoms. Um, now, they, of course, will also see a neurologist and uh, you know all the therapists and also like primary, primary care. So some of the things that we can offer that other people may not think about is uh, things like you know, a firm bed that can maybe decrease some of the contractures and help them with some of the bed mobility. Uh, we can help with the orthostatic control, um, you know, nutrition consult is always important. Um, bowel program, because they all have GI hypermobility, and they can cause constipation, which I know we all talk about bowel all the time in our consults. Um, you know, bowel evaluation for a hyperflexive bladder. Um, they also have a lack of blinking uh, in some, uh, so you can offer some artificial tears, which a lot of people don't think about. And of course, sexual dysfunction, which is important for everyone. Uh, and then we can talk to the primary physicians or whoever is consulting about, you know, exercise medicine. Uh, um, actually, studies have shown that uh, exercise, especially aerobic exercise, has um, a potential correlative effect on the uh, on uh, protecting you from having Parkinson's down the road, um, as well as promote neuroplasticity. Um, and actually, there was a study done, um, I think in 2006, 
that show, obviously we know exercise decreases the risk of, I mean, Trey already talked extensively about the risk of uh, sitting, but aerobic exercise in particular, obviously decreases the risk of hypertension, strokes, um, decreases your blood viscosity, increases oxygen um, to your brain and other organs, uh, decreases you know depression, anxiety, and everything. Um, and then actually, there was a proposed mechanism in that paper that said when you exercise, um, you actively promote the use of your um, dopamine releasing areas all, all throughout your brain, in particular your um, substantia nigra, and as a result, uh, you can actually um, delay or prevent Parkinson's disease. Now, there's no proof of that. They're just they're proposing this. Um, as well, they said that um, when you exercise, um, because you're actively, it's an active biofeedback, um, you actually promote neuroplasticity in that you're basically growing new uh, pathways for different things to happen in your brain. So later on, if you do get Parkinson's disease, um, you can actually... Uh, do better if you exercise because you create these new pathways around the faulty pathways. So they actually did a study from 1986 to uh, 2005 of like 125,000 people where they basically look at them um, who exercise for more than 10 months a year versus not. And they showed that uh, people who exercise for more than 10 months a year had about 60% lower chance of end up having Parkinson's disease. So it's good. Um, and then, of course, you know, we can also offer assistive device and uh, some of the stuff. They have the laser guided cane, which helps with the uh, uh, gait. And then they have these little um, things that, you know, if you're having tremors, they actually can stabilize your device. So you still have the tremors, but you can eat because it absorbs the tremors. So, and they have that for everything, like not just spoons. All right. So. Alternative treatments. So this is the stuff that are, um, it's a lot, yes. And um, I guess I want to talk about each one of these and then talk about kind of what, how they think these things work and then what the evidences are. And then, you know, hopefully one day we can uh, promote these to our patients and see which one actually helps. All right, so we'll start with Tai Chi. So what is Tai Chi, right? So it's a, uh, it, it comes from Asia. Um, if you've ever seen any Asian Kung Fu movies, they probably do some of this. Um, it's, it used to be a martial art form, and it's actually one of the most studied and uh, accepted forms of alternative treatment, but it is not the most used alternative treatment. The most used is massage, which we'll talk about later. Um, so the proposed mechanism, they're not 100% sure, actually. They think it's a, it's a combination of basically aerobic exercising, stretching, a focus on balancing and say because it goes through all these various uh, postures um, allows people to, to feel relax and um, um, that over time allows you to basically have better awareness and control of your body and the surrounding. So what is some of the clinical evidence of this? So there's actually multiple uh, randomized trials, um, about seven. Um, this, this one is the biggest one. It's looked at 195 subjects. It compared Tai Chi to resistance training and uh, stretching over 24 weeks. And actually, both groups show increased uh, improvement in uh, motor function. Um, but interestingly, they saw the Tai Chi group showed a much better um, increase in the posture stability and overall had a fewer amount of falls. Um, as well, they did a uh, subjective study and patients reported that they felt better about life mood, which is always good, and that the people who are in Tai Chi said they're more likely to continue doing this or another type of exercise versus people who um, did resistive training. Um, so, so in this study, so they showed, so, so they looked at two different scales, the PDQ8 and the VPS scale. So basically, the higher score for the VPQ is worse, and then the higher score for VP. I'm sorry, for PDQ is worse and for the VPS is better. So basically what this says is, if you look at Tai Chi, um, so basically the Tai Chi is better in every category um, after six months, is what this says. Which is uh, not great because, you know, this is a uh, subjective reporting. It's basically sending out a survey, people report back, and then you're like, oh, that's great. We don't know if this actually helps. So they went one step farther and they did an actual trial of, uh, uh, gate speed or uh, walking speed. 
And they actually did see, I mean, you can see in this um, that people who did Tai Chi and who reported positive results also showed an increase in uh, 50 foot walk speed walk. So, so they did good. So this is both subjective and objective data to show Tai Chi actually does um, help patients with Parkinson's disease. And like I said, there's been, uh, yeah, so there's been, uh, I think, multiple, multiple case reports, but, you know, five big studies that are class one and two level evidence, and they all have shown increase in balance, motor, um, quality of life. The issue is um, all these studies, the longest one was the one I showed you, which was 24 weeks. So nothing has really been uh, over that. So it's really hard to say, um, you know, long term, is this like if they don't do anymore, if they continue, does it get better or worse or how it works? So nobody really knows. And this is really the issue with um, these complementary studies, not just for Tai Chi, but really for all of them, is that they all have studies, but they don't have long-term studies or they're poorly designed studies that sometimes just don't make the cut. All right. So uh, Qigong is one of the uh, things that you don't really hear about in uh, America. Basically what it is is they actually hold these particular postures, postures and uh, they basically, it's more of a uh, mind uh, meditation method where they, they believe in these points where um, uh, like the flow of qi happens and uh, they try to manipulate the energy in your body. And actually when you do this, you're supposed to um, tighten your sphincter and uh, put your tongue on top of your, uh, of your uh, mouth so you can connect all the dots so it's a continuous flow of energy. So you can try that at home. Um, it's, uh, it, it actually has been shown to decrease anxiety, and which is great. Um, but uh, again, like I said, in some of the short-term studies, um, they have shown some motor benefits in people who have done this over um, four weeks compared to non-intervention. Uh, however, this only short-lived. And then um, the one um, blindness study they did showed no significant benefit, but it was a very low-power study and um, it was not over long term. So again, nobody, this, so this one, great if you want to do this at home, but no great evidence. Okay, so massage therapy. So this is the most used uh, form of alternative treatment for Parkinson's disease. Uh, and really it's any type of soft tissue um, uh, manipulation. Uh, and in particular in, this, in the literature, they've been talking about three different ones. Um, Trigger therapy, the Alexander technique, and reflexology. Reflexology. Anyways, um, so all right. So to define these things, I don't know if you guys know what they are. So Alexander technique. It's basically they um, uh, they try to correct your uh, posture and and your um, uh, stance by using uh, basically they 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 move you around. Um, tracker therapy is basically it's a gentle rocking of limbs. I don't know if you ever seen that where they just kind of shake your limbs. I was going to show you a video, but it's okay. It's not that great. So they basically shake your limbs up and down and kind of by, um, it's a shaking therapy. And then the last one is for the hand and feet. They focus on certain points on your hand and feet. Um, the one that's interesting is in the tracker therapy. They actually did an EMG study for this, and and it actually did show. Uh, that there was a decrease uh, in, in the rigid limb after they gently rocked that limb. There was a, a decrease in the evoked stretch response in EMG. Uh, as well as they saw that uh, when they did a stress hormones, um, cortisol levels in your urine, um, it was decreased actually after the therapy. So it's not, um, so it's actually doing something physiological in your body that's helping the patient to decrease the tone and make you less stressful. Well, I think massage in general we all like because we, it decreases stress. So. I don't need to argue against that. Um, and then for the Alexander technique, they also did a randomized control trial that showed, um, you know, there was a de increase in uh, motor and uh, decrease in depression uh, over four weeks. And so, all right. So what does that mean exactly? So when they did the trial, they uh, they they measured um, your cortisol levels after treatment, and uh, they showed that. You can't see. Okay, so yeah, so you can see the graphs that after treatment, um, your cortisol levels are all lower than before. Basically, is what it shows. So it shows that there's actually a physiological change uh, in your body. 
Uh, unfortunately, there's actually been not any great studies on massage and Parkinson's disease. There's been literally hundreds of case reports, um, small, unblinded uh, studies that has actually shown, um, unfortunately, there's no actual randomized large control trials that um, has done this. Although I guess like you can't really, I don't know how you would do a double-blinded trial because how could you get a fake massage? I don't know. So, um, all right. So again, this is a, a summary, a kind of the, of that study of one of the uh, re, of a trial that wasn't really blinded, but they saw that through the different massages and stuff. Uh, so you know, um, pre innovation and post innovation. Again, this is a number scoring system that um, the disability scale. So you know, higher numbers are bad. So you can see before treatment. For all categories with higher after massages, it's all much better. Um, and then even after uh, in your follow up in uh, three and six weeks, it's be better. All right. So acupuncture. Um, so it's uh, so these are all the acupuncture points. So this has been used in uh, Asian medicine for. Uh, many, many thousands of years. Um, it also focuses on the idea of the energy flow in your body. And the idea is they stick um, needles to stimulate these areas to help um, balance this flow of energy. Um, now, the different points are chosen based on uh, your symptoms and uh, what, you're, uh, what, what, what exactly you're needing. Um, in modern practices, they are now using um, electricity, like electrotherapy, uh, as well as bee venom, um, as well and some ointments as well. And this is actually very commonly used, even among uh, white people in America. So, uh, yes. Um, all right. So, so this actually is. This has been actually studied a lot. Um, uh, they did both animal and human studies to see if there actual any evidence in this. So in the animal studies, they have shown, and I'll, I'll put this slide so you can see pictures. Okay, so in the animal studies, they have actually done two different, they have done multiple studies. So in this one over here, they did a study of basically a sham versus an uh, actual acupuncture. So they stick you in random spots versus actual sticking you spots that, you know, that are indicated here. So and they saw that um, there were many, there were so so this is just somebody who didn't have Parkinson's. This is a rat who didn't have Parkinson's, and they saw the sham and the acupuncture. There were uh, not too much difference. So here they did the one where they they infused Parkinson's in the rat, and they did two different um, points for acupuncture, and they saw uh, that uh, actually uh, so nobody so no so, so random sticks didn't do anything. Not much increase, and then in acupuncture rats, there actually an increase uh, in um, the uh, um, substantia nigra uh, activity level. And then they did; um, they also did uh, tyrosine hydroxylase staining on the side. And you can see A and D are the uh, controls, and then uh, B, E, and C, F are after the acupuncture. And you can see there's an increase um, in the uh, cells there. So something's going on there. So that's great that it works in rats. Um, what exactly does that mean in humans? So they said, all right, let's go do some humans. So they did uh, actually functional MRI studies on patients before and after uh, acupuncture, which is interesting. And they actually did show that there would increase activity in substantia nigra, the cardiac thalamus, and the putamen after acupuncture. And they actually show some images, um, which actually I just realized those are very blurry. But you can see the orange dots, yes versus the black dots, yeah. So so on the functional MRI, it actually does show uh, it has increased activity after acupuncture. That's terrible. All right. So so that's all great, but what does that mean You know, in clinical patients? Like, would you offer this for your clinical patients? Um, so there's actually been several, several, many randomized trials on this. And unfortunately, even though it has shown some actual physiological change in the rat and the functional MRI, the data for this in the clinical trials have been um, equivocal, meaning there's been a lot of studies that has shown very positive results, um, but there has been a lot of studies that has shown no difference. So, um, but it's generally safe. So you can still pre uh, prescribe this for your patients and see if it works. Although this is the only one of the alternative treatments that does have a side effect 
of you could potentially get a hematoma from this by sticking needles in people. So it's not completely uh, without side effects. But this is only one, so. So, all right, so music therapy. Um, so music therapy, I think we all have probably heard about it, um, which is the metronome, where people with Parkinson's use metronome to help with their gait. But it doesn't just, uh, it's not just metronome, it's also, you know, the, any use of music, sound, rhythm, melody, harmony, it can be listening, singing, playing. Um, but the extent of its effect is really unclear. Um, there's uh, been shown that the music in general releases multiple new They've actually did a functional MRI on this that showed um, you have an increase in the limbic activities, um, and then you have increase in the, the mesolimbic dopamine release, um, and then you can also inhibit pain signals, pain signals uh, if you uh, let people do music therapy, which, you know, I think we should probably do this for all of our patients on the floor, just have music blasting over you know, head and decrease the narcotic use. Um, so the idea is that by playing instruments, they think that, uh, or by singing, it promotes reorganization through neuroplasticity, similar to exercise. Um, the immediate auditory feedback of each movement that you provide um, as a result can create new pathways. Um, this is actually, they actually did a study to try to see, well, uh, you know, uh, was there increased brain activation? And they actually saw in functional MRI there's increased gray matter volume um, when people after a period of playing uh, instruments. But what does that all mean for um, us and the metronome therapy? So they did the study, and you can see the picture there. Um, I'm trained and trained. So you can see there's a increase in um, cadence and you know increase in gait. So it's, it's really pretty good. In this study, all they did was have them no, so did, well, yeah. So they did the metronome, but they also did marching music. They also did uh, tap, like rhythmic tapping and stuff like that. And they actually showed that the rhythmic tapping was detrimental to the patient, probably because they were disturbing him and not focusing on walking. And then the marching music, there was no difference in the gait. Only the metronome, for some reason, worked. Which I think I said here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. So the evidence is, yes, so music therapy can increase gait speeds, uh, step length, can reduce freezing. Um, but uh, so, you know, not everybody wants to listen to the metronome when they walk. So uh, one of the things we can always help them is maybe perhaps uh, do a, be a little DJ, get a little playlist for them so they can have their own thing. Um, and uh, overall, though, music therapy seems to have a positive effect on patients. Unfortunately, uh, again, there's not a great long-term study on this yet. So actually, they show one of the study I read that said. Uh, let me see. Let me go back a little bit. No. So so they actually said that if it, the, some of the music. So yeah. So. So they said some of the music was. Marching did not. So some of the really um, yeah, yeah, and uh, so it's you got yeah. So that's why you have to personalize the music to the patient because you know if, they, if you're giving them like heavy metal and they are country, you know, like Paul, that he's not going to use it and he's going to be falling everywhere. So. So it's important to personalize your medicine to um, to the patient. Is it's a story here, you know? And who says that you know physiotherapy doesn't do anything, right? I think we do too much, actually. <laughs> um, so severity, oh, no. So biofeedback, mindfulness. So so a lot of the stuff I'm talking about here really, um, is, this is an underlining um, kind of the mechanism for a lot of them, you know. So it's the uh, you getting. The use of cues and like you know things that allow the media feedback that allows you to um, overcome some of the issues with Parkinson's disease. Now, mindfulness, which is actually spelled wrong, therapy uh, is actually basically you tell the patient, "Hey, you're not walking anymore. We want to hurry along," and they say, "Oh yeah, I'm not walking." So then they uh, become aware of this uh, issue, and then they start walking, which is interesting because why does that happen, right? So. 
is the proposed mechanism is that uh, they think that by just simply telling the patient that, hey, you know, they're taking you from an unconscious and, you know, kind of everybody take this for granted walking to something where they can consciously think and then it evokes a different pathway so you can actually start walking again. Um, I don't know if that's actually true or not. But it works, actually. So I saw many, many videos of this, and it's very interesting. Um, uh, and then, you know, and the, the big issue with this is, you know, a lot of patients undergo a lot of emotional issues, and these issues can actually uh, bring on more problems, like freezing the gait and decreased gait. And so by allowing them to consciously think about these things, they can kind of overcome these um, incidences and um, get over, over these. Um, <clears throat> So in this study, they saw they looked at 20 patients. Basically, they looked at um, relaxation guided imagery um, for patients um, for you know biofeedback and mindfulness therapy, and um, it showed that you know there were some improvements in tremor, um, but it was not long lasting. Um, there's actually been several smaller studies that has shown no difference um, whether people are consciously thinking about it or not. Um, and then the largest one uh, is the one with 41 patients here that I, I was talking about. Um, it showed that it reduced tremor, but if people just kind of concentrated on it. And they increased dexterity um, over the 10-week course. Um, and this was the only one that was randomized. The, all the other ones that showed, you know, great improvements or no improvements were more just kind of like four or five patients they saw. Uh, and now who doesn't like dancing on a, you know, Friday night? Um, Dancing therapy is actually great for uh, Parkinson's patients because it uh, it's a combination of music therapy, biofeedback, cueing of a mindfulness therapy, um, and it really promotes agility and balance. So, so there's been actually a lot of studies done um, different types of dances. In particular, um, people seem to like tango um, because it it's a very core, it's a uh, it's a this very deliberate steps that um, patients or oh, not the dancers use for this you know forwards backwards and uh, in the study I just want to point to the middle one um, they saw that people with tango this is walking velocity versus regular uh, you know exercise which is resistance training um, they actually tell people with tango had um, they both had better improvement had improvement but the one in tango had uh, better more improvement. So, and you know some of the other smaller things like um, theater, expressive art therapy, uh, kind of self-explanatory, you know, theater. Um, but what exactly do they do in theater therapy, right? Like, I mean, do they just go and perform or what? So, there you go. This is what they do in theater therapy. So you know, so they have vocal warm up. They have you know preparation in the scene. They have um, staging. They have um, all these different things that allows you to work on you know your postures, your mobility. Socialization is always important because depression is a key factor in our patient population. Um, and the evidence actually shows that uh, long-term therapy um, does actually decrease the need of uh, dopaminergic therapy, which is great because if you're on dopamine therapy for a long time. It, uh, it increases the side effect, and it just doesn't work after you know approximately five years. So if you can delay um, the onset of the need of these medications or how much you need dosage, then that's always good. Unfortunately, there's no class one, two evidence for this. Um, nobody has actually studied this. All right, we'll skip that. So where's Menard? Menard, tell us about, tell us about yoga. <laughs> Know about it. Can, you, can you demonstrate? <laughs> so, so yoga is it's actually a Hindu spiritual uh, discipline, which um, focuses on breathing, uh, meditation, and uh, specific body posture. And I've never done yoga myself, but I hear that it's um, actually very, very tough. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot, it takes a lot of core and strength, right? Is our, is our understanding is, and. And the great part of yoga is really a holistic mind-body approach. So it focuses on, you know, not just your physical needs, but also um, your spiritual and um, in your thinking process. But uh, evidence-wise, um, it has been shown to decrease cortisol levels, increase the gaporinergic activities, um, patients report improved mood, has decreased anxiety, 
Now, there has been uh, a lot of case reports for uh, Parkinson's disease on yoga, um, but there's not large power study. Um, so in this particular study, they looked at yoga over three subjects. And it did show an increase in the range of motion, better uh, body posture. They were able to have better balance, less falls, more motor function. And patients did report um, they felt better about themselves and about their prognosis. And so last and not least uh, is vibration therapy. Um, they actually first noted this back in the day uh, when they were writing carriages for patients with Parkinson's disease. And they noted that patients after riding a carriage had less Parkinsonian motor symptoms. So the picture on the right there uh, is the machine that you can buy, and uh, they actually, you can uh, basically vibrate your body when you're standing on there. Or you can have personal you know, vibration devices or people. Um, so the, the, they propose that the mechanism underlying vibration therapy is that uh, it allows for neuromuscular and postural adaptation. So, so, so I guess after, right after riding the carriage, your body seems to be able to better handle kind of the, the waving nature of you know, what you just went through. So as a result, when you're walking, it, you don't have as much vibration, so this, your body compensates for it. Now, from the studies, um, uh, they did uh, like placebo versus actual vibration therapy, which I'm not sure how they did that. They said they just placed the patient on the machine with or without vibration, which I don't I, I mean, I feel like you can feel the vibration, but anyway, they think that they don't see a big difference uh, in the placebo versus now. They think that you know all the benefits are really from the patients just thinking that this is going to work. Um, basically, this is what I already talked about. So, and you can do it in different positions on with the machine has you know to allow for it better. Uh, so interestingly, they said that the marijuana. Um, seem to have some um, protective effects of motor um, symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Uh, unfortunately, there's been no um, FDA-approved funded study, um, but they did do one study in 2007 that showed in seven patients, it's an observational study, these patients saw less dyskinesias um, um, when uh, smoking marijuana. Actually, not marijuana, nablon, which is a marijuana synthetic. Um, and actually, uh, there is, uh, I don't think there's ever gonna, really gonna be a FDA approved study for this anytime soon. So maybe Denver. Yeah. Maybe they'll see like, you know, there's like less Parkinson's in Denver overall than the whole world, and they'll be like, huh. Oh. So, all right. So there's actually, so, so like I said, there was no, there's no neuroprotective uh, medications or treatment at this point, but there's some things uh, that are being seen in Asian literature that, it has been proposed to be neuroprotective, uh, at least in rat models, meaning uh, it actually um, halts or treats Parkinson's disease. Now, again, no, no big studies. So one of these herbals, um, and, and, and you know, like nature is the best doctor, right? So the herbal here, uh, XFDCP, it's actually been shown in rat models to, um, uh, it actually stops cell death, yeah. Stop cell death, yes. And uh, it reduces the yeah it reduces the metabolism. So it has actually been shown to be neuroprotective. Now the issue with this particular herbal is that um, there have been several studies that looking at this, and they have concluded that it's very hard to study because they sell these in these um, uh, herbal shops, and they basically mix in whatever herbals are around. Well, they don't do that, but they use different combinations of herbals with this, and so they can't. It's hard to have a very concrete you know one one uh, dosing for this. Um, so there's a big study now underway in uh, China of 320 subjects who are in the middle and early stages of Parkinson's disease who are getting this and, or the placebo, and they're going to study this effect over the next uh, several years. Some of the other herbals are, uh, you can see here, um, these are uh, actually levodopa-containing compounds, so obviously that works for the reasons that you probably think it works for. And then you have some other things like um, ginkgo or coenzyme Q that are anti-inflammatories that uh, seems to help. So a lot of stuff. So basically in the end, I just want to say, you know, there are a lot of alternative treatments listed here, 
they all seem to have um, uh, great potential for helping patients with Parkinson's disease as a uh, complementary or an add-on to what they're already doing through the medical field with the medications and whatever surgeries they have. So depending on what the patients um, prefer or like to do in their life, I think it's uh, there's no reason why you should not be able to direct them to do any of these if they are interested. There's some evidence that says that these are very helpful um, and that they can help them. So, Dr. Cruz, Dr. Han, uh, food, knowledge, guidance. That's it. <laughs> Uh, I figure people be sleeping. Yes. Yes. Four to six weeks, all of them. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, the dance therapy. Maybe I can pull up this uh, video. Um, the, uh, because patients, they love it because they're in their 20s, you know, and they're still in, um, it does actually help with their motor. Every study I read actually has shown that they, uh, every, every study I've read showed incre better improved motor function. I didn't see a single study that said that it didn't help. So... Uh, during dance therapy, they didn't, they didn't say during dance therapy how many falls they had, yeah. <laughs> All right, never mind, it doesn't work. So basically what this video showed was, uh, it's basically Parkinson patients that was like <laughs> saying how much they love dance therapy, so. So the overall is to... So the overall is I think, you know, Parkinson's disease is, um, it's it's a complicated disease that you know some patients some people I think some, some of the fields treat the disease by giving certain medications but as physiatrists I think we should promote or at least advise when we get consulted that there are a lot of the other options out there that depending on where the patient what their interests are I think we can offer a lot of different options that can not only help them but delay the need of these medications and so you delay the adverse effects of these medications that's the key. Well, music, I don't know if we do music therapy, that the metronome stuff is, you know, it's, it definitely helps, so. Um, I mean, I think in the inpatients, I mean, I think a lot of this is more outpatient based, and, you know, you see them in clinic and you can kind of offer them this, but in an inpatient, I think, I think I, the patient, the, the, the consult and the one I met, I think she had just gotten the deep brain stimulator. And that was the reason that she came, because she just had surgery, so she had a bad stability from the surgical process, plus the Parkinson's disease. So I think we're trying to just get her kind of more strength and endurance rather than actually helping her with the, you know, I mean with gait too, but this, you know, it's more for outpatient. Yes, Dr. Cruz. It's good to that we have some kind of choices, but at the same time, number one, if we directly have to support with the outpatient, number two, insurance, does any of this I'm sure that covered by the insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, and three would be the expertise of the people who would be doing that. For example, right. how, where and how would you refer these people? I think you should, you should send them to China. The other one is actually whether the studies were done in any of the stages in Parkinson's. Now, they are saying now that there are major four stages in Parkinson's. Right. Speak. The motor the prodromal, and then the answer is the cardinal signs and the middle stage or the moderate uh, stage of the Parkinson's late stage. stage. And the question is when is the best applicability of the alternative treatment in any of the stages? And lastly, that I'm going to make comment and after this, I'm going to shout out would be um, how would you really initiate this? How would you? How would you classify the patient who would be really um, best candidate for any of these alternative treatments? Now, you know, you heard some studies about 
uh, the benefits, for example, of yeah, the whole body uh, vibration. I wonder really what can I send this patient to this whole body vibration type of China. You can buy your own machine, actually. <laughs> so actually, uh, so most of these studies, when I read them, they were all done uh, for stage one and two Parkinson's disease because they all commented on the fact that you need the least to release, the, the least the use of these medications, which is the really the probably the most uh, usefulness of these alternative treatments is that you can delay or decrease or stop increasing the dosage of levodopa and carbidopa because the higher dose you go, the more side effects you're going to have, and you know it's really good for only about five years, and then you. Put, Symptoms start. The vibration therapy, they did comment actually on um, patients who had stage three uh, uh, motor disorder because they just stand there, don't really do anything. And it actually shows short term that right afterwards they did have um, pretty good um, motor. They were able to like have better posture and stand a little better. Um, I didn't really read too much into the different stages. Um, I don't think insurance pays for any of this, to be honest, because it's not proven for sure. Um, you know, so. You know, they will have to probably pay for this out of pocket, unfortunately. I'll forget your other questions. You mentioned I could do the benefits of caffeine at all? No. Well, caffeine is neuro protect. Yeah, caffeine is like caffeine and smoking decreases the risk of Parkinson's disease. Yeah. What are the benefits of Yeah, so we should go, you know. Right. Take a couple minutes and we can uh, start. Thanks. You want to live on in infinite? This morning I woke up at like 9 o'clock. Pictures. Yeah. Good job. Okay.